present one of these insightful lectures entitled The Undivided Attention and Devotion of Bhakti Practice Part 1 of 6 on Between Master and Disciples given in Chinese and English on October 13, 2019 in New Land Ashram, Taiwan, also known as Formosa. <笑>谢谢我听到了再讲一次不是一起讲奇怪你们立观了就好看为什么没有了差不多了<笑> 有时候闭关的好,有时候不好,嗯,看情况啊。Thank you. Yeah, I am here. <笑> Safe. <笑> 啊,你还在,两位,太好了,阿弥陀佛。How <笑> you say Omitofo in Korea? Amitabha. oh, very simple. <笑> Amitabha. <laughs> hey. Tavala. You came back from South Africa? America. From America? Yes. Oh, I thought you were in South Africa, no? I was. And now you're in America? Yes. In Mahin, as long away. I mean, even then, it's a very long way to just come back. Wow, you're diligent. Some of the charm for you? <laughs> no, Master, you did. How are you guys? Ah. Hey, very good. Good to hear that. Mm. Any special request? No, that's good. <laughs> I hope you answer no. Ah, no problem. I mean, no problem. No, no problem. Okay, la. Uh, can you see me from there, far away? Okay, la. <laughs> if you cannot see me, then you imagine <laughs> how I look like 20 years ago, 30 years ago. Mm, I thought this weekend I have a rest. Uh, because sometimes you need a rest. <laughs> even from nothing. <laughs> but then we had good news. We had good news. United Nations and all the countries in the world signed a <laughs> last meet <laughs> protocol, no? Mm. Approval. Let's meet. No meat is the best. <laughs> so it's becoming official now. I hope they'll just go forward become meatless. Not less meat, but meatless. No meat at all. That's why I came to celebrate with you. And I want to thank you, all of you, the good, the bad, the medium, the no good, no bad, <laughs> in between. The black, the white, the gray, yeah, in the middle, the brown, the coffee color, coffee milk color. Thank you all, okay? <laughs> Good or bad, I thank you <laughs> for anything that you do at all, even just a tiny bit to contribute to this result. And we're happy, happy, happy. Get in there. 
I don't want to tell you when, because whenever I tell you something, it's delayed, and I don't like that. Or it's spoiled. I don't like that. So I don't tell you how long. I let you drool and wait <laughs> for the midless day to come. <laughs> I'm very happy about it. Yes, so I try to do more retreat, more retreat. Even just a few days. Better than nothing. I just finished the three weeks and then I came back, see you, celebrate with the, the artists, and then I had another four days just now. I just came out today. Look any different? No? Yes. Oh. <laughs> I do. I do look a little different. Older. <laughs> four days older. <laughs> four days and a half. <laughs> Never mind about that. Sometimes I have a very good retreat, excellent, sometimes very tiring. A lot of organizing, fighting, and protecting myself and protecting someone who needs protection in some special case. It's not just like normal case because it's like that, you know, when you are famous or when you are against something that is already established and mainstream in the society, then some people love you, some people don't love you. And some people came for some reason or wanted something from you, they expect that you can hula hoop, make things perfect, and you didn't because their karma is too heavy. And they also don't like you, and then they're testing you, hmm? testing with different way, and it's not always comfortable. Because they think, oh, people say you are this and that, you're a master, but you can't do anything. So now I can do something, so to see if you can, what can you do about it? Maybe I don't do anything, but I still need to protect myself, and it takes some, some work. And. Uh, I also have to protect some people who work around me, some people who are concerned in this. I'm sorry, my karma is always heavy, so I don't always have the time to or the control over it. Like last time, I was here already on Sunday, and I meant to stay with you until Tuesday or Wednesday until all the artists gone and you are gone. But I can't. Something happened. So I had to leave and come back again, and leave and come back again. <laughs> I apologize, okay? I can't always do what you want, or what I want even. <laughs> I'm not that free. It's too much karma, yeah? Forgive me, okay? My karma heavy, heavy. What can I do? When you have heavy karma, then you have heavy karma. <laughs> then you have to deal with it in different ways. Forgive me if I cannot always do what you expect or be with you when you want. Huh? Okay? Life is not always about what we want, <laughs> but about what we can live with and be contented with. I'm not happy to not have been with you, you know, all that time from Sunday to Tuesday, the artist festival. I wasn't happy, but... I just accept it, okay? And I just hope you forgive me because many of the foreigners, they came from far away, huh? 20, 30 hours flight to come here. I don't mean the artists alone, I mean our people, our brother and sister, huh? They came from a very long way. They've been saving for that and I wasn't there for them. And after the party, I had to leave immediately. I wasn't very happy about that, and I hope they forgive me. I always have to forgive me. <laughs> I don't have any excuses. Even if I do, you forgive me. Lucky I'm still alive, and that's all you want, right? Not a scrap. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe a little bit of scrap, but I hide it. You don't see anything. <laughs> I'm always happy, good looking, yeah? Yes, younger every day, <laughs> you hope. <laughs> <laughs> I hope. <laughs> ah, okay. Uh, so congratulations. <laughs> yeah, congratulations. Your wish, your dream, your hope, 
your work has borne some fruits, yeah? It's not yet 100% ripe, but it's some fruit already, right? Yes. Wow, I really thank United Nations and all the leaders of all the countries for their wise decision. And uh, we pray that they continue to be wise implementing what they have written and signed. Just like many laws about the animals, like protection for the animals, don't let the animals suffer or fear or anything of any kind, but if you continue to eat meat, then the animal is going to suffer all that and more behind your back. You don't even know about it. People just do not know truly like that. Most people are very, very good at heart and love animals. If they see animals suffer in front of their eyes, I'm sure they would do anything to save it, save the animal. It's just they make no connection between a piece of meat that in the beautiful counter and the counter has been scooped up in the non-movable space in all his life or all her life. They did not know. They did not think. Too busy, truly like that. When you're too busy, you have no time to think and to connect or to do research into things or to even want to think about what is what. You just come back home tired and feel lucky that you have something to put in the microwave or warm it up and then just eat it. You don't even think. Poor people, truly, the Maya has been so clever in blindfold everybody up to now. Yeah. It's truly like that. That's why I feel sorry for everyone all the time. Even people who did harm to me or do harm to me, I feel sorry for them. It's too ignorant, too poisoned, too brainwashed, and just too blind. We don't talk about that. We're happy. Thank you. Thank you, United Nations and all the nations. God bless you forever, and we love you. I want to thank all the vegans out there, all the persons, all the groups, all the organizations, all the governments, anyone who ever promote compassionate vegan way of life to save our world for us and for the next generation. Even just in your heart, you wish the world to become vegan. And all the governments who approve, who make into law, or who are going to make into law, for the citizen to stay on compassionate, healthy vegan diets, I thank all of you. May you continue these noble actions to save our world and the planet for the next generations. May God bless you forevermore. I don't know if I read this already. Ah, okay. In India, we have many kind of practice, okay? I wrote something sometime, but I wonder if I read it to you or not yet. Oh, this is already read, I think. This one maybe not. All these artists, they, they talk like you, huh? <laughs> like they were my disciples. I hope the people outside don't think I pay them how much <laughs> for the speech. <laughs> yeah, some people, some people are getting paid for the written speech. If you are important, you know, if suppose if I am a prime minister of some kind, or even small island or something, if uh, they invite me to go somewhere and make a speech, uh, either I write it myself or my secretary wrote it or they wrote it and I just read it and I got something. Your master don't ever get anything. Who cares? Yeah? The world's going vegan. I was jumping, dancing inside my little office myself. And I danced with my dog. I said, hey, you know what? The world's going vegan. The world's going vegan. <laughs> if you saw me, you think he must have something not correct in her mind anymore. <laughs> Maybe we should look for another master. <laughs> you try. <laughs> There's so many masters around. Famous and no famous, a lot, a lot, a lot. 
Not a lot, a lot, but I mean, <laughs> quite some. Hmm? Yeah. Good enough for some people who like to do shopping. Hmm? I also went shopping until I found Conning Method and I stopped. Yeah. This one, I don't know if I have, uh, have written to you or not. Uh, about undivided, undiluted attention? No. No, okay, you're lucky, then I can read it for you. In India, we have many kind of practice, and one of it is called uh, bhakti yoga, meaning devotional practice. Bhakti means devotion. You devote yourself to God, uh, you haven't seen him, but you devote yourself all your life to God, like those monks and nuns. That's also counted as bhakti yoga, yeah? All kind of monks and nuns in our world, whether or not uh, they are uh, Catholic or Buddhist or Hindu, Jain or Sikh, these all belong to bhakti yoga, actually, because they devote their time and their life to the service of God and think of God alone, worship God alone, whether or not they can see or not see, they can feel or not feel, okay? And uh, they do get some experience, you know, it depends on, on how devoted they are and how one-pointed they can reach in their mind. But some monks or some nuns, they practice the whole lifetime and never go anywhere. Like some of the Zen monks say, if you continue to polish a brick, it will not become a mirror because they don't know <laughs> what the real thing is, not like you, lucky people. But bhakti yoga, in a real sense, is that you have to really be so devoted that you forget everything else around you. Yeah. One example is the Sri Ramakrishna. He already passed away. He's very famous though. He is so devoted to the mother, Kali, one of the goddess of Hinduism. Of course, people make a temple for her, ne? just like other saints in the past. Whenever you die, you have a temple. So that's why I told you I don't build anything anymore. The buildings already exist. We use it for the elderly or for some people who are not very well or children. And you guys bring your own house. Huh? Nowadays, everybody can bring on house, very cheap. Twenty dollars, you have a house. <laughs> Just bring it out, throw it in the air, and there you go. Uh, seal you from wind and rain, snow even. Yeah, wonderful. And you can take your bed with you, uh, sleeping bag is all you need. Huh? <laughs> Plastic tent and a sleeping bag, then you are okay. Mm. When I was a so-called disciple in India, I don't even have that. I only have an umbrella. Yeah, and when it rains, I just sit under it. <laughs> and I'm still here, yeah. So this bhakti yoga is very uh, popular in India. And uh, even though many people are not aware of it, the devotee of different religions, they are practicing bhakti yoga. But the real bhakti is that you have to really have undivided attention to that object of your worship. And then you, you will as attain samadhi. Yeah, small samadhi, big samadhi, that's not guaranteed, but you will attain something if you really have undivided attention. And that's also one kind of practice, one of the 84,000 methods of practice, yes. Uh, if you live long enough, you can try one by one <laughs> and tell me which one is the best. But I think the Buddha told us already and Kwan Yin Bodhisattva told us already and the wise uh, Manjushri Buddha told us already, etc., etc. Many saints already told us to practice Kwan Yin Method. And so we, we dumb dumb people, we just follow the saints. It's the safest way, okay? No other tantric, no uh, tantra, no karma, yoga, nothing. Actually, Kuan Yin Method also included bhakti yoga because we devote ourselves to concentrate on the light and the sound, which is easier than just concentrate on nothing. 
or, or just imagining a God which we did not see, or imagining that we are the light and we are the divine, but we don't see anything. The light and the sound is not the ultimate yet, but it is something for you to concentrate on so that you can go in samadhi easily. And the light and the sound also help you to concentrate easier. Of course, not all of you that I know. Because when you've grown up already, you're too preoccupied with so many things in this transient world. Very difficult for you to go inside. But at least, you know, now and then, huh? Oop, there's a light. Okay, okay, concentrate more for more light. Gone. <laughs> when you're too eager to catch the light, Again, it's gone. <laughs> Luckily, the sound is always there 24 7. And that is your uh, rock to lean on, okay? It won't leave you. Even when you're unconscious, the sound is going, going on still to help you, to help your soul, to help your consciousness. Help you in every way, okay? Yeah. Unless it's your time to go. Even in accident, it helps you to lighten the, the impact of the accident and help you in many ways, daily, even if you don't know it. Yeah, you don't know it. Otherwise, you will be kneeling all day, 24 hours, to thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. For you did that for me, did this for me. The Master Power, the light and the sound, always helping you. And we are very ungrateful indeed because we don't really realize too much about it. Some do, some don't, and sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. But it's always there for you. It's our true self. It's our master self. Of course, you help yourself, no? Who wouldn't try to help him or herself? If you're hungry, of course you're going to try to find food for yourself, no? If you're thirsty, you're going to try to find something to drink for yourself, no? Because you're feeding yourself. You're helping yourself, the same. The light and the sound is like that. It's your self, your true, real self. Imagine our little brain, eh? but it is not much <laughs> of a computer, and we can use only five to maximum eight percent uh, average people. And we still know how to take care of ourselves. Go, you know, oh, this is my body, man. Huh? I take care of it. I wear nice clothes. I keep it warm. I make food for it. I keep drinking, you know, make it look healthy and happy. Yeah, just a little brain can take care like that. Imagine your true, real, divine self. How would it not take care of you? Because it's yourself. Yeah, the self take care of the self. So actually, the Kuan Yin method is also a bhakti type of yoga included inside. Any kind of undiluted attention will also bring you some result in wellness, uh, spiritually, mentally, also bodily, okay? So like when you have severe headaches sometimes, you just go do immediate Kuan Yin and it's, it's gone, immediately. Isn't that so? Yes. Yeah, I'm telling you. <laughs> no other can heal you so fast like that. We are not practicing Kuan Yin method for headache, but I'm just saying, it's the cell who take care of the self, yeah? And the rest, sometimes we cannot because of karma, eh? Huh? Otherwise, you can heal yourself already. Yes. Sometimes if you have some pain somewhere, and you put your hand there together, and you call on your healing power. Or if you don't believe you have, you call on the healing God, and you get better, huh? But not all sickness can be healed like that. You need doctors, you need specialists to to go deeper into healing process if the problem is grave and physical and sometimes astral, okay? I mostly heal myself, but not always because sometimes the karma is too much, too overwhelming. Then I had to take pill to go see doctor or do all kind of things like you did, you know, blood tests, uh, pinching here, pinching there, x-ray, and sometimes I find nothing. <laughs> and the doctor thing. <laughs> I'm playing. What for? Who love to go to the hospital to play with the doctors, huh? <laughs> is that fun? You like? No. The hospital is full of germs. You go there, sometimes you go there healthy, you come out sick. <laughs> Even if they clean every day. But then people come in and out every day. 
and the sick people is not yet recovered in there. So it can never be completely clean. Sometimes the doctor gets sick because of that. Because your body absorbs also sickness. Not, not just breathing, the poor. Your whole body absorbs anything. So sometimes you notice that you went to the bathroom often for urinating. And you wonder how can so much water, because you didn't drink that much. Because the air is damp and you, you absorb the water through your pores, through your hair, through your breathing, anything. Where is my thing? Oh, here it is. <laughs> uh, this is not all. I have a lot for other things, <laughs> for worldly things and my things and all kind of things. I talk a lot. I was going to read your story, but I think I read my story, huh? Even if you have pets, you know, dogs, yeah, and you love them so much and you pay a lot of attention to them undividedly, then you will also feel well. That's why many people, when they have pets, they have less disease, less depression, uh, less many things, yes. Also the pets that you love emit secretly some kind of wellness, you know, wavelength, some kind of blessing, some kind of happiness from themselves. So sometimes you see your dog, he's not doing anything. He just lay there asleep, but you feel so much love from him or her, and then you in, in turn also want to love him or her. And love also heals you, because at that time you only see your dog. You don't see anything else. You don't know anything else. You don't remember anything else. And that is also a bhakti yoga. Heavens create animals for us to love them and for them to love us, so that we can be at least in some moments be away from all the troubles separate ourselves from the world, and then we will not be affected by whatever transpires outside our home or our uh, environment with our pet or with our husband, wife, or kids, okay, or friend, the one we love and we like and we get on well with. When we are devoted to each other, then it helps. But the problem is, it's not permanent. However much you love your husband or wife, she, he has to go to work, or oh, visit mother, or go birthday, that day go to her friends, her family, her cousin, and do her job and do whatever, or go out. Huh? Or when we sleep, we don't remember our partner, okay? Even our children, or our parents, or our pet. It's just that the Kwani is always there for you. The sound, the inside sound, always there for you. That's why we feel well all the time. Of course, I mean not all the time, because the karma we had to pay, yes. Otherwise, all the time are taken care of and blessed and loved with no end. Because of the Kwani sound and the light, even if we don't see, it's there, because it's us. It couldn't go anywhere else except inside us and outside us. We are swimming in it. We eat with it. We sleep with it. We think with it or we don't think with it. But we do not realize all the time. But the sound, whenever you remember, ah, is there. At least sound is the most original form of all creation. Is us. Yeah? So... If we are in contact with it, connected with it, of course we feel well. Hmm? There's no, uh, no need explanation, uh, no need to know why. Huh? <laughs> because when you have undiluted, undivided attention to something or some subject or to God or to the saints, to dog, then you are truly separated from the world, oblivious to all its problems. Thus you feel free and you feel peaceful. And that's how bhakti yoga works. Yeah. But the bhakti uh, devotee, they, they practice more. When we love our dog, it's just that moment. But the bhakti people, they love God or they love whoever, their master or whomever they worship, or 24-7, if they can. And that's how they can get the result more obviously and more deeply 
If you continue to have such one-pointedness, you will achieve liberation. Because that's one of the methods of practice, one of the 84,000. So even if you devote your attention to your dogs, I told you, cats, <laughs> your pets, uh, any pets, enjoy their love, you will be also oblivious to the world's physical karma at that time. Nothing affects you at that time. That's why most people who have pets, they become well. They have more wellness. Yeah, they're more happy somehow. Yeah. And because of that, they will be also more successful. There was one multi-millionaire in America before. He became so desperate, you know, because he lost everything or whatever happened to him, he became homeless. And then a dog came to him from nowhere, and this dog loved him, gave him love every day, just doing nothing, just love. And then suddenly, this person became strong again, and he became millionaire, multi-millionaire. Because he worked, he suddenly know how or became more happy and more determined to gain back his life. And he became multi-millionaire afterward. And then, and then he built houses for dogs. Every dog's room must have window, must have glass. So the dog can see outside. He opened a dog house, a dog center, but mansion. So all the dogs have all the comfort like a human. All the dog's room must have glass door so that the dog can see outside when they are inside. So much gratefulness he had for the dog that he took in all oh, many, many dogs and took care of them. Spent his money for all the dogs because of the dog that gave him courage and inspiration to live again, to fight again for his life for his happiness and success. It's a true story, huh? It's a true story, yeah. That's why it is well known, you know, that people who have pets are healthier and happier. Hmm? Just sends us so many of these helpers. They're lovely, unconditional. No matter what you give them, good or bad, they stick with you and give you all love. You know what? Even the dogs you have helped a long time ago, many years ago, and he passed away, and he came back. He might not be able to find you. You might not be able to be reunited with him or her, and they are with other owners, for example, but they still have you. In my case, I know. And have you a big way, not just a small way. Have you to avert some some big problem, and you know my problem is big, it's not just normal problem, I still the dog can help far away from me. He doesn't see me, and we don't contact physically. The dog is still helping me now. I don't know if I should tell you everything. Let me think. <laughs> because sometimes if I tell you things, then it won't work anymore, because the concerned persons or persons who try to harm me will, will know it. If it's too detailed, then you know it. Actually, it's also not an ordinary dog, eh? <laughs> but all dogs are not ordinary. All pets are not ordinary. All animals are not, anyway. But this dog also special, sent like secret agent to help me, because sometimes I'm too busy to help myself. Also, it's not convenient in some cases because, for example, somebody tried to harm me and if I return that power as I have threatened to do, that person will be in big trouble. So the dog can dilute it slowly, yeah? The problem is not solved immediately if I send it back. I do send it back in some cases. Uh, so that they learn something. Huh? They eat their own medicine and leave us alone because I'm harmless to them. Not like I owe them something in the past life or I did something wrong to them in this life. I check, no. It's just badness, jealousy or greed sometimes. Like sometimes they think I can give them a lot of money and I don't. I don't give just money to everybody. <laughs> I give to whomever I feel 
genuine need, yeah, I don't even give it to you if you are not genuinely in need. Money means nothing to me. Just that I give where I need it. God entrusted money to me, not for me to just squander it around, just to look good, to feel good. And people will <laughs> stick around and applaud in all day. It's not like that. huh? Everything God given to me, I must take care with all respect and appreciation and use it in a good way. Just like your parents give you money, you don't just go out and just throw it around, no? Yeah, you save it, you put it in the bank, you do business, you make it better, huh? You earn more to help yourself and others. Yeah, it's true. God sent us so many animals to help us. Yeah, to remind us of the loving quality because God is love. If our love is awakened, yeah, even not in full extent, it still earns us a good place in heaven. And then from then, or the master, the past master who reside in heaven, or the present master who come up and down different heavens will help us to move upwards. So we don't come back to be reincarnated again in such suffering in a different form. Some animals became animals because of karma, that's no doubt. But most animals, they voluntarily come down to help us, like my dogs, for example. They didn't have to. But there are such guardians that there's nothing I should know they wouldn't tell me. They always tell me things in advance to protect myself. When I said that in this period of our earth, a master will not be killed, that doesn't mean not danger, okay? That doesn't mean the master is always safe, yeah? You don't have to die <laughs> to cause a dangerous situation. We die sooner or later. It's just while we're living, there are many obstacles, many traps, many karma, give and take, to take care. So dying is easy. Dying is simple, free. Yeah? But you have to live to suffer. That is worse. Because for a master or for many a practitioner, dying is nothing. We know we're going home. It's just not dying is a problem. <laughs> not, about dying. not dying is a problem. So these animals are our best friend. You can see uh, many people who raise dogs or cats, you know, or adopted them from outside on the street or from the adoption center. They suddenly become better health, yeah, or, or more wealthy somehow, business blooming, or uh, people love them more, and suddenly everything goes better. Yes, because of their power, of the pet's unconditional power and undivided attention. The dogs, they don't care who's where, who's where. They only concentrate on you, because they love you. That's all they know. Even the God come down, I don't care. Bark them away. Move, move, move. Ow, 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 ow. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sometimes my dog saw some guardian around and they bark around. I said, who's that? And I said, oh, yeah, these are friends. Why are you barking? And they said, never mind, we just bark in case. <laughs> <laughs> Prevention is better than <laughs> cure. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and even any other dogs come near, they bark at them or try to prevent them to go near me. Yeah, just in case, <laughs> just in case they are bad dogs. They also help us to change our way of life because some people, they love their pets, yeah? They love their adopted dogs, cat, birds, whatever, and then suddenly they realize that the other dogs, the other pig, uh, cow, other ducks, they are, uh, they are also animals. Same like their dog. And then they change to vegan, vegetarian diet. Yeah. So the dog help in an in invisible way as well. And they help us to return to our loving self. And then slowly, slowly, we have more luck to find a master or a good method to practice. And then we also get liberation. Yeah. And then the dog's job is done. Some dogs do come back reincarnated to find you again for some reason. 
when they maybe they see you need help. But they were not dogs. They came in the form of the dog only. They sacrificed to come down in this lowly world in such a cumbersome body. What's wrong with my hair? <laughs> if you have hair, you have problem. If you don't have hair, you have problem also. Yeah. Before I had no hair. I went through every airport. They checked me so much. They bend my shoes and X-ray my uh, layers of my handbags. Even <laughs> hiding something. Not every country know what bald head mean, because they also have some people like they have their own gang of bald head. I don't want to mention the name. And then uh, they make trouble. Yeah, and they're famous in the world for making trouble. So I also have bow head, and then I may be one of the gang members. So I had trouble. So I start growing hair, and then I have other trouble. <laughs> I have to comb, I have to wash, and then I have to dye my hair even, which I don't like. Part of the job. They don't believe it, but it's part of the job, yeah. Before I didn't know, to be a master you have to be blonde. <laughs> <laughs> and then it just became like that. Yeah. There was uh, one of the episodes in American soap opera. There was one series called Monk. This inspector, his name is Monk. He's a very excellent inspector. He knows many things and he always cracks cases which nobody else can. And uh, together with uh, other policemen, eh, inspector, they're doing good things. I'm the chief of one of the police department. He's elder and he has mustache, nah, like that. And then one day he has to be moved to somewhere else or something. And he let his deputy, who is a very young guy, maybe twenty something, not yet thirty even, to take his place. So this young deputy <laughs> also grow a mustache here very big. <laughs> and everybody come in and look at him and say, Oh, uh, what now? Why? And he's a part of the job, <laughs> because the boss also had, you know, a mustache, so he thinks he has to, to grow one just to look more authoritative, <laughs> say, part of the job. <laughs> so it's up to us, really, where, whether or not we have pets or we have chosen to follow some teacher to practice some kind of methods in the 84,000. We have to follow our heart, and we just have to live a righteous way. Then we can be sure of homecoming, and or at least have a comfortable life in this physical dimension. So undivided attention and love help you. Concentration on present moment only also help you a lot, because that means you're separate from all the karma of the world. They will not touch you. Hmm? We not only have our own karma, we brought with us since birth, but we also polluted by others' people karma around us. One of the Chinese philosopher, I think Zhuang Zi, somebody Zi, they are Zi, one of the Zi, just say that the society is a big dying tub. Like we're together, so we die almost similar color. Yeah, because inside the same, same tub. Yeah, with a dying uh, material in it. Society <laughs> I say it's good that I still remember something. So let you think that I have a little education. <laughs> If we concentrate on whatever work we have at hand, that also helps. It's called karma yoga in uh, spiritual uh, terminology. Everything is called yoga or <laughs> practicing method in India. It's true also. That's why the Buddha say we have 84,000 practicing method. There's a story about one guy who came to study with a Zen master. The master taught him things, but he didn't get nowhere. Maybe he didn't practice well. Maybe he went to sleep as soon as he sit on cushion. <laughs> or maybe he just sit there thinking of something else. So he never got anywhere. So he came and asked the master, please help me. Is there anything else 
you did not teach me. He said, I taught you everything. It's up to you to make use of them or not. He said, but I got nowhere. I cannot do anything. I cannot even concentrate. So the master said, oh, okay, there's another one. Not the way. okay, tell me, tell me. So the master said, go out, find a job. <laughs> Earn a living. Yeah, because actually when you're working, you have to concentrate on your work. Otherwise, you cannot do your job well, no? Or you get fired because of survival to earn a living. You have to concentrate on your work. You have to. Work is given to you. You just have to do it. There's no choice. So you concentrate on your work, on the present task at hand. That is also another kind of uh, undivided attention. And that is called Kama Yoga in India. But actually, Kama Yoga has a more profound way of realizing it. Like you have to, to work, work in any way, or work voluntarily especially, and dedicate that to God, to erase your karma. So that's why they call Kama Yoga, not Kama Sutra. It's different, okay? The men don't think nonsense. <laughs> the woman don't know, right? I had to know many things, sorry. Okay? I'm forced to know. <laughs> Sometimes they brought book to me. They say, Master, good one, <laughs> good one, <laughs> good one. Okay, good. I trust it. I, and I look oh, all kind of photos which I never saw before <laughs> inside. An explanation. That's Kama Yoga. It's different from Kama Yoga. Kama Sutra is different than Kama Yoga. Okay? I don't need to read that. Please. Okay. No need. Being a teacher sometimes is a nuisance. Many things people ask you, you have to know so that you can tell them, that's good, that's no good. Huh? Stay away from it, huh? for example. I don't have to know so many things, thank God, because you practice quantum method and you enlighten all by yourself. <laughs> you don't need to ask me so many things. Sometimes you do just nonsense about your cat, your dog, your whatever. Huh? But it's nothing big. So that's how karma yoga works. And after seven years, this guy came back to his master. And he said he still did not uh, get anything yet. So the master said, then I cannot help you. <laughs> that was the last <laughs> door that the master can show him. Eh? He still did not do well. And you know, some people don't concentrate on their work. They just work to past time, you know, looking at the clock, waiting to go home, but don't really devote their attention to the work. Whatever work you do, you have to do it like the last job in your life, the last time that you can ever do something to contribute to the world. All that attention. You work with respect, with devotion, with gladness that you could have a job that you are not a useless person, that you can contribute to the world that you own so much since you are born. That kind of attitude we must have. We should be very happy to be assigned any job at all and do the best of our capacity. Even if you sweep the floor, you be a janitor for the toilet, or you be the president of a country. Or is just job. And I'm not sure which job is better, the presidential job or the janitor job. I, I think the janitor job is better for you. You can sweep the floor, uh, mop the tires and recite the five names at the same time. Dedicate your life and your work to God. But if you are president, I don't think you have time to even recite one sentence of the five names or the gift that I give to you. All kind of things will come to you day and night. And even when you sleep, your problem is going to sleep with you, if you can sleep. I'm not a president, but I know. Last night, for example, I could not sleep because of other people's problem. They just come to me and ask. So imagine how a president has to deal with so many things internationally, nationally, yeah, and with the staff, with so many egos that hanging around him. The president or the king 
has no doubt many people who help him voluntarily also. But he also has to deal with these egos. They are not helping unconditionally, like a dog or a cat. They wanted something, attention, or at least some reward, a smile from you, a praise from you, or a certificate of volunteer of the year, <laughs> in turn, <laughs> of the century, whatever. They also want to be noticed, to have attention from the top, from the leader of the nation, proud to work beside him. And they have their mood, they have their ego, they have their competition and all this energy. And all their complain quietly or, or loudly will also go into your head when you sleep. As we absorb everything around us with our body, we absorb also other people's energy, thinking, bad or good. That is a problem when we live in the society. That's why many masters, they just leave the world, they fed up, really. They think the world has no remedy. <laughs> There's no remedy to help these so desperate wars, so troublesome, so complicated. That's why many masters, they <laughs> stay somewhere else, go into the very deep of the Himalaya, like Gumuk, for example, the source of the Ganges River, where nobody normally would go. That snow all year round, even in summer. And they eat very simple, or not eat, maybe, eat snow, snow. Mm. Maybe they just brought with them some rice and some dal, like uh, bean, yeah, lentil stuff, and just to last for some months. And if somebody come up, then maybe some labor or something brought them some other lentils and another bag of rice will last for another few months, for example, like that. But they have to wait until summer. At least summer we can see the road, and <laughs> in winter there's no way. Everything blocked like like a big mountain everywhere. And in summer, the army who stationed in the Himalaya, just the border, you know, they have to keep the border. In summer, they will came with the bulldozer, big cat, to room away the snow and make it like a small road in between the two big, tall wall of ice. And then the pilgrims can begin to go up to worship the mountains and rivers and some shrine of the past masters and pray for whatever they pray for. The Karma Yoga is not just concentrating on the work only, but to dedicate it for the wellness of others, like volunteer work for the poor, the homeless, or cleaning the temple for the monks, or the shrine of some gods and goddesses, and that is called Kama Yoga. Some people practice just that. They don't recite mantra, nothing. They don't even meditate. Maybe they do sit in front of the gods, statues, and quiet down. And sometimes, if they're pure enough, they can see the goddess or god appear to them, like Sri Ramakrishna. His wife became a holy mother. <laughs> They call her also Holy Mother. He married her when she was very young, just because family tradition. But he never had any physical uh, contact. They together in one bed, but he never did anything. He said he was tempted, but then he didn't. <laughs> and some people blame him, like sacrificing her. But she was okay. She became revered as a Holy Mother. India is a very fascinating country. I really love India. Maybe because I was Indian <laughs> some lifetimes, not just one. But I really feel like, as I told you last time, there's one place in Rishikesh that I feel at home. <laughs> just a mud house, a mud room, and a few stones in front of the house, and bag of chapati, and eat your peanut butter, and... Uh, cucumber, and I feel so good there. There's no other place that I miss, only that place. In the whole world, I don't feel like I want to stay anywhere. But if I have a choice, I go back there, <laughs> stay there. I feel just so free. Maybe it's different feeling at that time because I was from New Delhi. 
Hasok, Basok over there, and so many so-called disciples around, and they eat all the food and don't give me anything. <laughs> Left over nothing. And uh, so dusty, and so sometimes stagnant waste, drainage and all that. It's not my thai, my style. So when I went deeper into the Himalaya, you know, like uh, Rishikesh or Kashmir, or that, I do like it better. But I did not even like Kashmir that much, even though Kashmir is more beautiful than the hut that I have stayed. There's nothing really like of scenery or anything. Just um, on the mountain, in the middle of the mountain, and uh, trees, yeah, and the Ganges River is uh, just a few, maybe two, three minutes away. I have uh, free water to take to cook, and a hut, and I sleep on top of the roof. Uh, but I, I miss this place. <laughs> toilet outside, have toilet, thank God. Most places don't have. <laughs> so I like that place. That's a place I felt the best all this time, anywhere, compared to other places. Even this place, I don't feel that well. Actually, here it's only work, so naturally I don't think, <laughs> I don't think any teacher would feel well in his classroom. <laughs> 24, 7, he would like to go home, huh? Even the classroom, his school may look better than his little flat, but he'd probably like to go back to his shabby hut or flat rather than the fancy and clean and well-built school. <laughs> 